the circumcision. We worship God in spirit. Not in the flesh. To be bringing sounds from heaven. And yet we are bringing those sounds in the gyration of demonic spirits. Spirit, oh Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. We acknowledge your presence, Holy Ghost. We acknowledge your presence, Holy Ghost. your presence Holy Spirit we acknowledge your presence Holy Spirit we acknowledge your presence, Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. We know you are here. We can sense your movement already. Oh, we acknowledge your presence, Holy Ghost. Andila Cabera Susa Bante Cabilandos We acknowledge your presence, Holy Spirit. Oh Maracuva Tali Cabulati Avasu Sabaras. We can feel the weight of glory. We can touch the sweetness of your manifestation. We can sense the greatness of your presence we acknowledge you holy ghost 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 sweet holy spirit sweet holy spirit sweet holy ghost Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Oh my God. The presence of God is so rich here tonight. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' awesome name, we have worshipped. Holy Spirit, we trust you again tonight. Do that which you have proposed to do. Let Jesus be glorified. And let the name of the Father be highly exalted. Thank you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome someone by your side to your Bible study tonight. Hallelujah. Praise God. Holy Spirit, we ask that you open up the wells of revelation to us tonight. 
May none of us live here the same way we came. Speak to us in such clear terms that every heart will be confident that indeed they heard your voice. And when we are done, take all the glory. In Jesus' awesome name, we have prayed. Amen. Matthew 6, 6 and verse 24. Matthew 6 and verse 24. Um, this is where I'm going to stay. This is going to be my pivot scripture for this entire teaching. As of today... I don't know how many parts it's going to be, but I can tell you at least there are four parts in my spirit already, but we'll see how the Lord will lead us. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the beds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day, it's its own trouble. What is a parable? A parable is a simple story used to communicate spiritual truth. A parable is a simple story that is used to communicate spiritual truth. So when Jesus wanted to bring things that existed in his realm, where otherwise if he chose to communicate it in the language in which he wanted to, mortal man will not be able to comprehend it. Jesus will use parables. Because a teaching will not do you good except it leads you to the place of understanding. Without comprehension, without understanding, knowledge will just be information. And what we have in the body of Christ largely is that a lot of people, even when they study their Bibles, especially in this generation, what we go into Bible study, especially Bible study, looking for is just information. We are not seeking to understand what it is that the writer is trying to communicate. And without understanding, knowledge is not truly yours. For you to be able to say that I know something and this thing is really mine, you must have come to the place where you understand the truth that is being communicated. And I've told you before that proof of understanding is that there is practice. If indeed you say you understand what it is that you have been taught, you understand the revelation that has been communicated, we will see the proof of your understanding in the way you live on a daily basis. If the way you live contradicts the knowledge and the information at your disposal, there are two things. It's either you are not living what you believe because of a lack of faith or because you do not understand 
the depth of what is accrued to you as a result of practicing the things that you have been taught. For instance, if a Christian truly believes that their expressions in God and their relationship with God can be deepened by a consistent prayer life, their refusal to commit to a regiment of daily prayer is a product of them not actually believing that fact or not actually understanding that truth. If you understand it, the proof of your understanding will be reflected in the daily expressions of your life. For instance, if a Christian truly understands the power of sacrificial giving, it will be expressed in your daily life. If we do not see your daily expressions in the mortal realm or in the visible realm, um, showing forth the truths that you claim to have learned in the Christian space, then it means that you lack what? Understanding. Are you with me? So when Jesus wanted to communicate truths, communicate, sorry, truths that existed in his realm, and he knew that if he communicated it in certain languages, mortal man will not be able to understand such a spiritual truth, what he did was that he told simple stories to communicate such spiritual truth. And he told those stories in the context of things that the men in his day could understand and relate to. So that in understanding and relating to it, they could glean the juices that existed in what Jesus was trying to communicate. So if you read the Bible, you will find out that Jesus has 25 parables. 25. And out of those 25 parables, only five talk about money. Five. And in the course of this teaching, what I'm hoping to do is that I want to use Jesus' stories. Because in, in each of those five parables that Jesus spoke about money, or he tried to tell a story about money, there was a reality, a truth he was trying to communicate. You see, because I have found out that the way the modern Christian thinks about money is not the way Jesus thought about money. And, I, and in thought, I'm not saying thought as in to teach, I'm saying to think. The way we think about money in present day, the way we approach money, the way we value money, the, 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 the priority we give to money is not the same thought process that Jesus had when he related with money. For instance, and these things I'm going to say in this teaching, I know that it's going to cause a lot of issues for me, but I'm ready. For instance, it is going to be very difficult for you to convince the kind of rich church we have in present day, to convince them that their savior was a poor man. And I'm using these two terms, rich and poor, in the sense of the indices by which wealth was measured in Jesus' day. Bro, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, you could not list him among the richest men in his generation. The indices by which men were considered rich and wealthy, prosperous in financial terms, because when we talk about prosperity, there's financial prosperity, there's the prosperity of your soul, there's the prosperity of your health, there's the prosperity of your life. In terms of financial prosperity, in Jesus' day, he was not classified as one of the richest men in the world. And I can give you various examples. One case in point, 5,000 men, excluding women and children, were seated. And then Jesus is moved with compassion and he wants to feed them. And then he turns to Philip and says, Philip, um, we need to take care of these people. And, 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 and he's wondering, he's, he's like, may, may I go ask Peter? So, the disciples are confused because they do not know how they are going to feed 5,000. So they come back with feedback and they tell Jesus that, look, even if we wanted to feed these people, we don't have the kind of money required to be able to buy the supplies that are needed to feed these people. And even if we had the kind of money that is required, where will we get 
the amount of supplies that are needed to feed these people. Somebody said that um, a preacher that is talking like the way I'm talking now does not know Jesus. That even Roman soldiers were fighting for his underwear. That for Roman soldiers to have been fighting for his undergarments is because Jesus was very rich. That what kind of undergarments were that? That must have been very expensive. Or guy, you don't know scriptures. Because the truth is, there was nothing fantastic about his undergarment in the terms of price or in the terms of the quality of what it is that he wore. It was not Gucci. It was not uh, Jojo Armani. It was not Yves Saint Laurent. It was none of those designers. It was a normal undergarment that any man in his day wore. The value of the undergarment was not in the material with which it was made. The reason the undergarment was precious was in the circumstances surrounding it. Certain things become valuable because of the circumstance in which those materials find context. For instance, the match ball, the match ball of the European final between Liverpool and I think it's AC Milan. Footballers will help me now, sport lovers. When Liverpool came from three goals down to win the, the Champions League. Which year was that? Huh? If I ask you which, 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 if I ask you now, where this verse is in the Bible, you don't know. Okay, so it's either 2005 or 2006. Do you know that if they were to auction that match ball today, people will bid in hundreds and thousands of US dollars, not because the ball is fantastic, but because of the context surrounding it. What they were bidding for was not the quality of his garment. They were bidding for the exclusive rights to say, I was there when a great man died. And I have the ticket. That's what they were bidding for. It's not because his undergarments were of any exclusive material that they had not seen. It was not tailored by a beautiful, fantastic garment or a tailor that was exclusive. It's just because of the context surrounding it. That's why the soldiers gambled for it. It's not because Jesus had plenty of money, and he bought the best garment that was available at that time. Somebody said, how can you say that Jesus was, was, was broke and Jesus was not rich in the context of his day and he had a treasurer? If you say that Jesus was, was, had a treasurer because he was very rich, what work did Jesus do? Huh? What was Jesus' business? Did you ever read in scripture that he sold chair and table? Did you ever read in scripture that Jesus went to work, that he fished, or he engaged in business? How then was Jesus getting money? Of course, people were giving to his ministry. And as, a, as one who modeled a life of accountability and integrity, he needed to make sure that there was somebody to keep the books. That's why Judas became necessary. And Jesus deliberately chose Judas because he was trying to help Judas cure his appetite. He knew Judas was a thief, so he gave him the bag to say, okay, I hope that if you, if you take care of my money, at least if you want thief person money, and you hear that the money belongs to Jesus, fear. Are you with me? So if he became afraid to steal from Jesus, somehow his appetite will be cured. But well, he was not afraid. In John chapter 12, the Bible tells us that from time to time, he used to take some of the money for himself. Somebody that was not afraid to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, his lack of fear did not begin that day. It's something that had existed in his heart. Because if they, if they tell you that, if Jesus comes and gives you bag and say, hold my money for me, even if demons are whispering left, right, and center to say, steal the money, you'll say, I beg you, I beg you. 
Because you know that before you steal it, we know that you are going to steal it. Oh, you don't understand. Judas was in meetings where Jesus will hear what people were thinking in their heart. He was in such meetings. And Jesus will now begin to speak the thoughts that were in people's heart. Judas would have known that if he, as much as thinks that he's going to steal from the post, Jesus will know. So he will know that there's nothing he's doing that is hidden. All the others may not know, but Jesus will know. And the reason John records this in his gospel is because John was very intimate with Jesus. So one of those days, probably when Judas was just going around looking very pious and sanctimonious with the bag, and acting all righteous and holy, Jesus just whispered to Judas, he the thief money, oh, he the thief. <laughs> so John said, shoo, he the thief, he the thief. <laughs> so that's how John knew. So he so when, when Judas was trying to be pious and righteous, and said, why, why, why was this ointment not sold and given to the poor? John recorded it there. Say so it's not because he had concern for the poor, but because he was a what? A thief. Are you with me? Praise God. So the reason Jesus had a treasurer was for accountability purposes. There is no indices by which wealthy men were measured in Jesus' day that would have allowed you to categorize Jesus as rich. Does that mean now that I'm saying that it's a bad thing to be rich? Does that mean now I'm saying that wealth is a sin? Does that mean now I'm saying that uh, there's no need for one to seek to be financially prosperous? No. As we progress in the teaching, what I'm going to show you is that wealth without purpose is a disaster. Wealth, without that wealth, meeting the need of those who are less privileged is useless. Of course, God within the confines of righteousness and the standards of scripture expect us to prosper. And you see, I've said this many times and people have come to meet me in private and say, okay, what do you mean? For instance... Not every Christian will be wealthy. Hmm. Not every Christian will be rich. And you see, because we are unwilling to embrace this truth, hmm, the average believer has now become covetous and desperate to do anything to make money. This is why you have young men, some who are sitting in church tonight, who are now hooked on gambling. And the reason they are hooked on gambling is their spirits have become so shared, so seared, sorry, with hot iron, their conscience is dead. They are waiting for a preacher to come and show them. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 5. Thou shalt not gamble. He said, hey. Oga, what business is the gambling company doing that they have that kind of money to give you? Or don't you know that part of the money you are sharing is part of the blood of certain individuals? You don't know it's a Ponzi scheme. They are robbing Peter to pay Paul. The system is designed in such a way that everybody cannot win. It's deliberately designed that some people must lose so that a few will win. And the few that win is just to give it a good face so that they can continue preying on your greed. What drives the gambling industry is greed. Oga. Okay? Are you not an arm robber, so? You want to put 20 naira and get 20 million or ga carry gun? <laughs> Are you not an arm robber? In which kingdom teaching 
Are you going to put 20 naira and take 20 million? God doesn't work like that. I will show you in this teaching when I begin to talk about one of the parables, seed and bread. One of the parables we will talk about because we'll start dealing with the parables next week. I want to lay foundation tonight. When we talk about seed and bread, I will show you the rule of work and why God respects work. It's a principle. But somebody just wants to do short odds, um, this one and this one. Crystal Palace will win Arsenal, and then he puts 100 naira, and he's looking to get 200 million or 20, whatever thing. I had a friend in school in those days before they digitalized gambling. What did they used to call it now? Pool. He was so moved by greed, he went to go and use his school fees. I assure you, if you give him the microphone, his life is a PowerPoint. His life is a PowerPoint slide. The title of the slide is How to Not Be a Greedy Fellow. He used his school fees. He... He, that is the way he, was, he, he lost his admission and had to go and forge documents to see how he could just keep pretending that he was still in school. And that's how he never graduated from that place till today. It's not that they told me he's my friend till, to, till tomorrow. Because he wanted to amass wealth without following principles. Following principles. The reason we are like that, and there are some of you in church tonight, you are listening to me now. Gambling has put a hold on your soul. I'm trying to show you why. You have not settled it in your mind that not every Christian will be wealthy. Now, one of my sons, when I said this one time at the tent, came to me later and he said, Okay, sir, you are my father. Anything you teach, I agree, as long as it's scripture. But wait, how does God now choose the people who will suffer and the people who will be wealthy? <laughs> because me, I will, not, I will not be able to take it. If God is saying that others can be rich and then me, why, why did he choose me? <laughs> What's the basis? What's the basis for that kind of choosing? Because all of us are the ones that are suffering. Can I show you some realities in scripture? Give me Proverbs chapter... Um, chapter um, let me find the scripture. Let me show you some realities. I'll come to Proverbs 30. I don't want to get to 30. Give me Proverbs 10, 15 first. Proverbs 10, 15. Proverbs 10, 15. The rich man's wealth is his what? The destruction of the poor is their what? Hmm. Give us a simpler translation. Give us NLT or Bible in basic English. One of those ones. The wealth of the rich is their fortress. The poverty of, their, of the poor is their destruction. Give me a message. Message. Hmm. This one is even is indigent. <laughs> Give me an IV. Or good news. The wealth, wealth protects the rich. I like this one. But poverty does what? Destroys the poor. Do you know what this means? If a man now is living in a house and this rain that has been falling for two days falls and removes the roof of a rich man's house, the rich man can just go to his bank account, take money, call carpenters, buy roofing sheets, regardless of the cost. And within two days, three days maximum, the roof is back. Everything that water destroyed, he has bought some new ones. So wealth for him is like a defense. You cannot see him experiencing disgrace and shame. He cannot go to the hospital and they say oxygen. One can of oxygen is 30,000 naira. Then he begins to panic. Did you not read of stories in this Nigeria that a woman went to give birth and the, the wife gave birth to quintuplets? That's how many now? Five. I'll be eight. There was the one I want to talk about is eight. What is eight now? Eh? Octaplets. Octaplets. And then they called the man that his wife has given birth. The man ran. (laughs) 
Why, why did he run? Because he, he, has no, he has no fortification. There's nothing to shield him from that embarrassment. So wealth is like a defense. That's the reality. The poor, if the landlord drives him from his house today, he doesn't know where to go. That's the reality. If it's time to pay school fees and he does not have, he's looking at shame in the eye. There is no way to go. The destruction of the poor, poverty, destroys. This is the reality. So this is why that my son was asking me, he said, if, if God knows that this is true, even in the business world, they tell you that you need to use money to make money. If you are going to expand your business, if you are going to grow your product, if you are going to extend the frontiers of your enter enterprise, you need to be able to spend money. So why will God do it in such a way that some of us will never know the depths of wealth? How does God choose? You see, I have found out in my work with God that God sends his resources according to his original design. If it is part of your destiny, if it is part of God's plan that you are going to handle certain dimensions of his expressions on the earth that require you to have the tool of wealth, he will send it your way. God is not sentimental in that matter. This is what I told my son. Then how did God design that the poor should survive in that case? The way he designed for the poor to survive is that he put a system called his church. And when I speak about the church, I'm not speaking about denomination. He put a system called his body. The way the body of Christ is supposed to function is that everyone should not lack. Everyone should not lack. He blesses one so that that one becomes an outflow for the dispensing of his wealth and his riches across his body. The reason we are suffering lack, that the poverty is still destroying the poor, is that God has not been able to deal with our selfishness and greed. And this is why the wealth of the Nigerian church has not translated to the safety of our brothers in the north. Eh? The Nigerian church is one of the richest churches in the world today. It has not translated to anything solid for our brothers in the north. Nothing, nothing fantastic. I served in the north, I can tell you. Nothing fantastic. Look at our cousins on the other side. Eh? The money that enters their hand is strategically dispensed. There was a state in the southwest. Hmm? The first time I visited that state, relatively a Christian state. I came back one and a half year later and I was asking the man of God that was driving me to, to we're going to somewhere. If I say the place now, you know the state I'm talking about, so let me leave it. So I now asked him, I said, oh boy, this place has changed. He said, hmm. He said before, you could call it a Christian state, but now our cousins have taken over. How did they do it? Strategically. They understand this model that if one prospers, it's supposed to be the deliverance of an entire people. And don't be angry with me. I'm teaching you scripture. Acts chapter 2. Let's see how the early church did it. Acts chapter 2. Give me verse 42. Are you with me tonight? Yes, sir. It's Bible study. So let's... Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Okay, let's begin at 41. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. See why I was talking about baptism earlier. When you get born again, you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In scriptures, what happened next was that people got what? 
tongues. And that day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. Who is them? The church before this, the apostles before this experience. Next verse. And they, who is they now? The 3,000 plus the apostles. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in, breaking, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This is what we call apostolic culture. Next verse. Then fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. 44. Now all who believed were what? No, I can't hear you. They were what? Together. Together. Note the next thing. And had all things in common. Now, some of our denominations today are not as big as this church. There were over 3,000. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Over 3,000. But they had all things. How? They were what? Together. Go to the next verse. Because somebody will say, well, um, the church has grown. We are, we are too, so large. We cannot. These people were over 3,000. And they did what? Sold their possessions and goods and did what? Divided them among all as anyone had what? That means it's not like present day. Where you cannot even trust a Christian to tell you the truth. If we start sharing rice now, Some chairs will not survive. <laughs> Even people who have rice at home, we kill. And you know the way we do those things? With a pious and sanctimonious face. Some will even be speaking in tongues on the line. You will not know it's rice. They want <laughs> right, they want to call it they can't even tell the truth in present day. He says they shared as anyone had need. That means anyone who had need was prioritized over others. You are not here. Anyone who had need. So we came and said, okay, um, all them, Ola, all of them, they are, in, they are in school. They need school fees. Then they say, okay, school fees people. Then the one that can pay school, he say, no, no, I'm not inside. Maybe they called his name. They say, can I join? He said, no, 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 sir, I've, I've paid. These are my brothers and sisters. They have need. But now, we will say, now, nah, combination of nine rice, take the fee pot. I beg go. I beg go. I will not miss the day of my breakthrough. You know why? Greed. We have, we have not been able to deal with our greed and selfishness. This is how the early church survived. This is how they were able to manage the situation. So those who had possessions, you don't understand. Holy Spirit, help me tonight. Those who had possessions, they sold them. It was not a matter of me. It was a matter of us. Self had died. And you know, last week I was trying to wrap up on the three kinds of men that exist in the world. And you can find that in, okay, give me 1 Corinthians 2. We are coming back. Go to verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14. You will see, Paul lists the three kinds of men. There's the spiritual man, there's the natural man, and then there's the carnal man. Look at verse 14. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually the son. And I told you that the natural man is the man who is born into the world and is under the government of Satan. He can't understand spiritual things. He doesn't know spiritual things because they exist in a realm that requires another faculty to discern it. And if you have not, that faculty of your existence has not been activated. No matter how you try, it will look like foolishness. That's why they don't understand why we live the way we do. The natural man cannot understand 
that God will be blessing you, give you money, and instead of you to be thinking of how to build a monument for yourself, you are concerned about other people. The natural man can't understand it. That's why they write books like, uh, how many laws of power now? 48 laws of power. That's why they, they give all kinds of speeches to tell you that when you are in a business environment, you have to go ahead and you have to be ruthless. I remember I came back from youth service thinking that one of my family friends, an uncle like that, will help me. And I reeled out my achievements to him because he was a deacon in a denomination. So I thought that when I reel out my achievements, he would be impressed. So before I started talking, I told him of how, oh my God, I, I volunteered to be a missionary and I was there and people were coming under the influence of the Holy Ghost. I saw people healed. I saw people delivered and I spent all my money there. And then when I finished, he said, you are a foolish boy. <laughs> you are a foolish boy. You know your mother didn't have money. What much did you save during youth service? I said, daddy, I could not save. I was concerned about it. He said, you are a foolish boy. The natural man cannot understand the things of the spirit because to him, they are foolishness. I wish he could see me today. I wish. Next verse, 15. 15. But he who is spiritual, so there is a transition from being a natural man to a spiritual man. And how does that transition happen? The life of God is put in your spirit and your spirit is regenerated. Now that your spirit comes alive, you can now discern the things of God because the way you discern it is by his spirit. He who is spiritual judges all things, yet himself is rightly judged by no one. 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Who is we here? The spiritual man. Are you with me? Next verse. And I, brethren, we're in 1 Corinthians 3 now, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. So even though they were born again, Paul, looking at their lives, could discern that they didn't know what it mean, meant to be spiritual people, that they were carnal. And one of the signs of the carnal man is that he's a babe. And one is, one, what is the major characteristics of, characteristic of a babe? A babe is selfish. Thinks only of himself. A baby does not care whether the mother is dying. Once he wants breast milk, the whole world is going to stop for that breast milk. He doesn't care. I want to talk to you as spiritual people, but you are carnal. You are still a babe. Why are you carnal? I can still find expressions of the natural man in your space, even though you claim to be spiritual. So even though we have great expressions of Christianity in modern day, there's a lot of carnality in our midst. Self is still magnified. And this is why the systems that our forefathers operated cannot find expression in our space. So everybody wants to be rich. And the sad reality is that everybody cannot be rich. Not all of us are going to be wealthy. But God designed a system to guarantee that even if you are not wealthy, you will be comfortable. You will have your needs met. But you see, the average Christian is not just thinking about his needs. He's not contented with his needs. You know why? He's under pressure to prove a point to the world that is also succeeding. And you see, if God will do anything this first night, I am praying that he will rid us of greed. Amen. He will flood our hearts with great contentment. Amen. That's what I'm hoping. I'm hoping that the Lord will come to us and take the pressure off our souls. So many of you, I saw you when I was praying. The reason you are depressed, you are under pressure. The reason suicide, 
The demon of suicide has found access to your heart and your mind is that you are under pressure. You are using the wrong indices to measure your life. Give me Proverbs 37 tonight. Proverbs 37 tonight. I am praying that God will help you and lift that, that cloud of darkness that is resting on your soul. That cloud of darkness. See, bro, one of the things I told myself early when it looked as if my life will never amount to anything, I sat myself down, called myself to a meeting, and I told myself, Kesena, you are not in competition with any man. Not, you, you, you are not in competition with any man. People I graduated and left school before will call me and say, Papa, Kai, God is good, oh. I just got a job. When they now tell me salary, I will nearly die. <laughs> Meanwhile, the one they are calling Papa and say, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. I'll say, oh, God bless you, you succeed in that job. Meanwhile, my wife will tell you now, my shoe, the way I was, it was as if God had forgotten me. I sat myself down. You are not in competition with any man. I told them one time, I don't know whether it was in Bible study, I said something like, if you are living in a house, for instance, eh, and you cannot either take you from your six-month salary to pay your rent, or you cannot save consistently in 12 months to pay your rent, you are living above your means. Rent is not an emergency. You say, sir, I don't know how it happened, but I'm in an emergency. What's the matter? Say, my rent is due. Or, God, you had 12 months. Or is it six months? Depending on where you live, it's not an emergency. If you cannot take, save from in, within six months and pay your rent, or at least you are removing a portion from your, your, your salary every month or from your business and keep it, when you keep it for 12 months, it amounts to your rent. I tell you the truth, where you are living, you are living above your means. And you know the consequence? Unnecessary pressure. Say, sir, my wife is about to deliver now. It's an emergency. Eh? Im emergency what? Nine, you have nine months to prepare. It's not an emergency. You have nine months to prepare. But you know the problem? We want to go and do an antenatal in a private hospital. You say, uh, 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 all these government hospitals, there's a way, there's a way you, you cannot afford it, bro. Go even if those that government hospital they kill people there, eh? that the infant mortality rate is 99.9%. When you operate by the principle of heaven, you will always be in the 1%. That's how it works. Everybody can go there and they say, hey, the doctor forget cutting wool. Hey, now so the woman died. You will come, your wife will deliver smoothly. Because you can't serve God and serve mammon. If it is God that you serve, your trust will be absolute in him. And when you sustain that posture, he will come true for you every time. Because he knows you don't have options. Hmm. There's a book I read. I just, I, just, I just, a pastor, one of my pastors came to see me from, I think, uh, Ozoro. And was asking me some questions, so I was sharing with him as a brother. Just giving guidance. And I told him this book. I need to get you a copy. Written by one of our fathers, Billy Akoni. The title of the book is Tapping into God's Resources for Life and Ministry. If you love money, don't read that book. <laughs> Brother Billy will damage you. He will damage you. <laughs> don't read it. You will not recover. 
He grew to such a point that even his, his underwear, his briefs and his singlet, he doesn't buy. He was a, he's a full-time minister. He's in the book. He said he will just, he will just go to God and say, they are becoming brown, no? Then God will say, okay, I've heard. The next day, two days, three days, somebody will travel and the only thing they will buy, singlet and briefs. One story that shocked me, I don't think any mortal alive can try it. He traveled to either the UK or the US to go and preach. And the shoe, the mouth was open. Life story. As he came down from the aircraft, the, his son in the, in, whether it was UK or US, I can't remember, saw him and said, uh -huh. Daddy, you travel with this kind of shoe? He said, no, no, no. Tomorrow morning we are going to buy new shoes. He now said in his heart, oh, Lord, you know I didn't come here to disgrace you. If this boy is concerned about this shoe out of pity, remove the thought of the shoe from his mind. <laughs> Somebody said they want to buy you a new shoe. <laughs> Stay with me tonight. This, this series, you see, you will prosper. Yeah. <laughs> Woo. You will. But it might not be as you are expecting that you are going to be driving a Cadillac everywhere. According to God's will and plan for your life, he will send resources your way. And when those resources come, you will not envy the man in a Cadillac. You know that he has his own assignment. You have yours. And as Paul will show us, that's why I'm going to tie this up later today. As Paul will show us that you came empty-handed. And when you leave, you will leave empty-handed. You will leave empty-handed. You, you must prosper. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what, what Satan tries to do. You must prosper. The man, he stayed in that UK and the US, did meetings. I think he said five days, I can't remember. The boy completely forgot the shoe. He will come and carry Daddy Billy from the hotel with the shoe with hole. He didn't remember it. It was as they escorted him to the airport. You know when you carry somebody to the airport, then you people jeez, jeez, then they now say it's time to board. It's okay, bye bye. Oh, then he carried his bag about to board. The boy saw the shoe and said, Hey! So, that did the shoe, the shoe. He just smiled. He knew that it was not God that moved the man's heart, it was pity. That the Billy doesn't want anything from you from pity. What he wants is what God told you to give him. Some of you have learned how to be master, master pity party. Celebrants. You don't know the way to trust God. The only verse in Matthew 6 I want to deal with tonight is, is 624. No man can serve two masters. So it means, therefore, that the same kind of way God wants to master and control your life, money is looking for that same opportunity. Money. Money can become such God over your soul. That's why the average Christian has not learned the way of sacrificial giving. Say, out of this small money I'm earning, how can I give? Bro, it's because you don't know how to trust God. It's not foolishness. Like I told you when I was announcing just now. If God has not stirred your heart to give, you are not wrong. Are you hear what I'm saying? There's no pressure. Say, no, no, no. I, I can't just be coming to the tent and they're announcing this money and I'm not giving. We don't do things in this kingdom emotionally. There has got to be a stirring. He said, as many as they that the Lord has moved upon their heart, tell them, collect from them gold, silver, 
for the building of the temple. I will deal with that when I teach the parable on contentment and faith. There's no emotional thing inside. If you have not been stirred by the spirit, it means that he doesn't have a demand for you in this matter. Where he will have a demand for you, he may not have a demand for me. Many times me and my wife will sit down, look at our finances and say, Kai, we don't have this money, but you just get one SOS from somewhere. And you know that the reason the SOS came to you is because God trusts you that you will respond. And then we'll give. Stop telling yourself, I'm too broke. Uh, 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 oh, oh my God. If I can't take 1K from this 10,000, person not go die. So, and that is why you have not seen the hand of God. When you begin to trust him at that level, because if it is God that you are serving, what Jesus was saying in that Matthew 6, 24, oh my God, too many things are happening in my spirit. Help me, Holy Ghost. What he was saying in that Matthew 6, 24 is, a man that loves God cannot love money. Are you with me? Yes, sir. And the man that loves money cannot love God. And this is the war in the body of Christ now. Where you are, you are teaching everybody cannot be an entrepreneur. It's not possible. Some of us, our calling is to walk. Walk. That is how God is going to bless you. There's nothing wrong with work. I've taught you before, the wealth of the poor man is hard work. Just as money is a rich man's defense, hard work is the poor man's salvation. Hard work. Well, have you not seen that scripture before? Is it Proverbs 12, 13 now? Is it 12, 13 or 13, 12? Give me, give me 12, 13, let me see. Proverbs 12, 13, let me see. Give me 13, 12. Proverbs 13, 12. Ah, no. Let me find it. There is much food in the tillage of the poor. Who has seen that scripture before? Okay, 13.23. 13.23. Proverbs 13 and 23. Yes. Much food is in the fallow ground of the poor and for the lack of justice there is what? So a poor man can be very productive if he does not have discernment his labor will be wasted. That's what that scripture is saying. Old King James says for the lack of judgment. So there's the, your, the wealth of the poor man. When you already know that you don't have the same opportunities and the same expressions that others might have, you work harder, twice as hard. I'm in a higher institution. I see young people who their parents are weeping. Just this exam, one of my colleagues was very angry with a student. Can't you have mercy on your parents? Your parents. It's obvious your parents are laboring. When you come to school and be fooling around, it's poor people's children that mess around the most. After the, the parents have struggled to pay school fees, she will now come to school and go and get boyfriend. What, what are you looking for? And they not be able to pass exam. Then your parents that have calculated, your mother that is selling tomatoes somewhere, trying to give you a future, has calculated that she's going to try and do ND for you. And she's tying the school fees in her mama. Managing. Then you now come and tell her that you, you failed the entire session. So they say you should repeat the session. She calculated two years. You want to give her hard labor of four years. 
There is much food. Much food. The way the poor makes up is by hard work. Hard work. When I entered the HSC profession, everybody on the field was running away from going to do the exam. It was 400,000, the exam alone. Nebos, it was 400,000 that time. 2006, 2007. 400K. Then they were not doing it anywhere in Delta State. You have to hire a hotel, attend the classes, and then write exam. So you were, you were going to spend up to 500 and something thousand. The minute I entered there and God said, I want to build a career for you in safety. That's all I needed. I started working hard. When I finished that professional exam, even the clients, HSC people, used to come to the office to say, where the boy, where they say, pass the test. I was like a god on the site. Hard work. My generation doesn't want to work hard. We sit down and just dream about money, money. Is the same disease that is affecting our weddings. I've told you many times, if God wants to give you an easy wedding, take it with joy. The reason some people are ashamed to do simple things is that even within the body, people will mock them. Let us bring a couple here now. This Sunday evening, and the brother is seated in front, like where Blessing and his wife are seated now. And they come in their native Ankara like this. And we say, it's their wedding day. I can bet you two or three sisters will say, hey. <laughs> now lie, pass out the joke. They're not they marry. It's here. The mockery will start here. Because we don't know how to do things together. We are the ones putting ourselves under pressure. Because we don't even know the way of the Lord concerning money. What we are trusting God to do in this series is to deliver us. So the wealth that he wants to release into our hands. I, when I talk about, I think the first parable I'll talk about is God's technology for wealth. And I'll talk about wealth transfer and then I'll talk about seed and bread. Hmm. I'm going to get blessed during this teaching. I will get blessed. I will get blessed. Hallelujah. God needs to cure our, our selfishness and our greed. Don't be ashamed of hard work. Don't be ashamed. The salvation of the poor man. Hard work. Have you heard them say, the Englishman says there is dignity in labor. Dignity. I is in this worry that I was doing a marketing job. Alekbo used to be a very terrible place. The roads were so bad. And then my, my Oga that time, it was in, in a hospital. I was marketing for a hospital. There's one Zenith bank at Ogunu. If the staff are still there, that know me. Anytime from the gate as I'm entering, they'll be telling me, doctor, doctor, doctor. I became a doctor. Because as I go out to market clients, I will do talk on hepatitis. I used to read in the night, study. I was talking like a medical person. Because I will give you a lecture. Then when I finish, we will tell you that there are free vaccinations. When I finish giving you the free vaccinations, I will now tell you, come and do your retainership with our clinic. I wear one cheap tie. But you hear me talking, you will think that I went to medical school. I studied. They now told me there was one company inside that Alekbo that uh, they might want to do retainership with my hospital. And I went there, trekking after I trekked. I didn't know, I was thinking about my life. You know how when you're walking on the road, just thinking, say which kind of life be this? <laughs> <laughs> trekking seriously. I didn't look at the ground. I just stepped in one mud. The thing reached my trouser here. I'm not exaggerating. The mud stained me, all my shoes, small shoes I was managing to this place. A grown man, I'm not exaggerating, no. grown man. I didn't know when tears fell from my eyes. Grown man. 
You know that kind of cry you are crying? There are no words coming out of your mouth. Because your heart is overburdened. There is no right word to describe what you are feeling. The only language at that time is tears. I removed my leg. I... <sighs> Nobody say I graduated with, from school with pass. Even if I graduated with a pass. <laughs> but the Bible says that weeping may endure for, for a night. It's the same thing when I enter drilling. If you hear me talking about drilling, bring any engineer here. Let's start talking drilling. You will think I'm an engineer. The minute I enter drilling, I'll be reading every night. Because you will come to a drilling meeting, safety meeting, when they are talking. They'll say, um, so we are running a hole, and then we'll bottom hole assembly. I'll be looking like a mogul. I say, ah. I say, no. It doesn't work like that. I started studying. When I talk drilling with drillers now, one of my colleagues who is in petroleum engineering, he was writing his handout. He sent me a copy of it and said, how does this thing look? I'm not an engineer. My background is mathematics. But I've been on a drilling rig. Some of them that graduated from petroleum engineering have never seen a rig before. I labored on a drilling rig. I studied. When you know that you are already at a disadvantage, your salvation is what? Hard work. Hard work. Because the Bible says that a laborer is worthy of his wage. Hard work now becomes the instrument through which God will now begin to direct funds in your direction. Your hard work now becomes an excuse for the one to whom you have pledged allegiance to say, bless him. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other. So it means that a man that loves God cannot love money. And a man that loves money cannot love God. And a man that loves God, the proof of his love will be in his trust and his service to God. The church in present day does not trust God. We don't know how to trust God. In our personal lives, we don't know how to trust God. Panic! Panic! is upon most of us. Panic! That's why God cannot come and tell you, give that last money. You don't trust him. And listen, that kind of experience is not unique to you. Jesus knew that as mortals, we can be plagued with such infirmity. So he said, consider the lilies of the field. Consider the birds of the air. What was he trying to do? Give you assurance. He said, are you not of more value than they? I used to tell my wife, some people would just think that, oh, Reverend Kess is rich. He, I, the man, get money. You don't know that I have conditioned myself. I trust God with my life. Some of you see me driving a Mercedes. You think I bought it? You, th you think I bought it? That car. Let me tell you. That car. Eh? Tokumbo is 20 something million. Go and Google it. So you think that we souls that are perishing now. I will take 20 something million. <laughs> then you don't know me. My last birthday. Workers and ministers. Decided that they wanted to. To, to put a put joy in my heart. And they went out of their way and bought me a gift. My wife is here, she will tell you. As I brought the thing out of the box and saw the receipt, I dumped it. No. It's too much. I dumped it. And she was not telling me that, no, it's because I, I dumped it. How, how did they get to that point? 
That car was sitting on my own. My dad was supposed to come in country. And then he sent the car ahead. And somehow God made sure he didn't come. So the car ended up in my house. <laughs> it, so those of you that have been saying man of God is not a good thing to be man of God <laughs> you, you, see, you see man of God car say now this guy man of God God call me well oh, call me well <laughs> you don't know how I got there you don't know how I got there I live in absolute trust absolute trust God is hearing me. He knows my heart. I've told him many times, you can trust me with money. Many times. He sees my, if he tells me, give all that you have. It's gone. And I won't think about it. I know before money. There have been times where <laughs> God will say, give that money. As I give it, as I wake up in the morning, I will see an alert. Sometimes the exact amount or twice my wife will tell you, if, if somebody asks us for money, I will just come up with a figure. She will be shocked. 20,000. Those things are not emotional. I just brood upon it and Holy Ghost says, give this. It's gone. It's, this thing I'm teaching you is not the way I'm doing hand like this. Your heart. Hmm. Your heart will bleed. But you can't serve God and serve mammon. Your service begins with trust. Absolute trust. You love him so much, you can't love money. And the proof of that love is in how you trust him with your life. Trust him with your life. I want to make three quick statements as I want to close tonight. Huh. Three quick statements. Because of many things that are flying around. Let me ask you a few questions. How much money did Jesus have that he used to fulfill his destiny? Joseph, that was in the prison. How much money did he have that he used to fulfill his destiny? The problem with us is that the problem with us is that you think that you must have the money. You don't understand that the money can be in somebody else's hands and God can use the person to finance your destiny. Not once, not twice. I have paid school fees for students I don't know from Adam. Not once, not twice. And I don't do those things emotionally. They just enter the office. One lady like that was crying. So I sat her down and I said, and I interviewed her. Nobody to help her. And I'm not moved by all those kind of things. But the Lord struck my heart. You think that God cannot take care of your life? You want to have it. You don't know that you don't need to have it. To become something in God's hand. God can begin to direct men to take care of you. Have you not read those kind of stories? That a man will just pick somebody from nowhere. Just generate interest in the person's life. And just finance the person for life. Why do we think it cannot happen? They say you must have money. If not, if you don't have money, you can't fulfill destiny. Ah! Money! Preachers are telling us that if you like, be a prayer warrior. If you are a prayer warrior and you don't have money, you can't fulfill destiny. I came to tell you tonight, there's no conflict between prosperity and prayer. No conflict. It is, it is wickedness. And it is misleading for someone to be elevating money above prayer. Money is a medium of exchange and it's only relevant in this realm. In the realm of the spirit, money is not a medium of exchange. And you don't need to believe me. Go and read Acts chapter 8. After Peter moved in power 
And Simon the trainer saw the move, the sorcerer. He saw the move of God upon Peter. Then the Bible says that he came and he offered them money that he might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what did Peter tell him? He said, your money perish with you. For you to have thought that the things of the Spirit can be bought with money. In the realm of the Spirit, money is not an exchange. In the realm of the Spirit, there are mediums of exchange. One of them is faith. Your tears can be a medium of exchange. Prayer. Keep me broke. But let nothing happen to my prayer life. If I can keep my prayer altar raging, God will send men from a far country. Give me Isaiah 46 and verse 10. Give me 46 and verse 10. Isaiah 46 and verse 10. Quickly, quickly. Isaiah 46 and verse 10. He says, speaking about the Lord now, he said, what does he do? Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not done, say my cancer will stand. Is that what I'm looking for? Oh, where's my tablet? I think it's Isaiah 46. 11. Okay, go, go, go. And I will do all my pleasure. Where's the protocol? Come now. Hold this thing with me. 46 verse 11. He says, calling a bed of prey from the east. The man who executes my counsel from where? Far country. A far country. God can call a man you never knew to come and, to come and perfect his will in your life. He can. But the problem is, our generation thinks that you must amass all the money. So they are doing everything to amass money. Doing everything to amass money. You don't need to have it. God can channel it in your direction. He puts it in people's hands. And those people can become a blessing to you. When I read Daddy Billy's story, I went to preach in a church. Oh my God, it was one of those days that the Lord mantled me. As I ministered. The fragrance of his presence was so rich. When I finished. A brother was trying to break protocol to come and meet me at all costs. So I was watching from my side mirror. I was in the car. They were saying, no, now the man of, he said, I must see him. I, I said, okay. So I, I put, I said, let him come. So he ran to where I was. And he said, as you were preaching, I heard Jesus. He said, I should buy you five suits. I said, me? He said, what's your suit size? So I told him, you think I will tell you? I told him. And then he said, okay. If you count the years now, it's 15 years more. He has not bought the suit. As I was driving and living there, as I was living there, I remember that Daddy Billy story and I said, God, Lord, if this thing was emotional, don't allow him to remember. You think I didn't need suit? At the time I went to preach there, I had one good suit. Ash color. I know how much it cost me <laughs> to get that one suit. I wear it on the choicest of occasions. When I look the kind church where they go preach, I say, so that the name of the Lord will not be blasphemed. They are wear this suit. What an opportunity to get five suits. But I had learned from the fathers. God can use men. Do you know that he can put your matter in somebody's heart and that person will not rest until you are established. The ones that are laboring to make the money, they will become old and their bank account is still empty. But you, you are flying. You are not laboring half as they are laboring. But he called it a man from a far country. And the agenda of that man is to come and execute the counsel of God. Prayer is not in conflict with prosperity. And it is misleading, misleading for you to be telling people that if you don't have money, you can't fulfill destiny. And I challenge you 
eh, that is listening to me now and feeling Pastor Kess has come again. Show me the basis for that in scripture. It doesn't exist. Are you trying to tell me somebody like Anna wasted her life? Who stayed in the temple fasting and praying day and night? Are you saying she didn't fulfill destiny? How much did Joseph pay to fulfill his destiny? I'm asking, how much? What about Jesus, our Savior? Our Savior, how much did he pay to fulfill his destiny? There's no conflict between prayer and prosperity. Give yourself to prayer. If you really know the power of prayer, God will have your needs met. The problem is that we do not know the power of prayer. We don't know the power of prayer. I read of men who, the, who their stories say that none of their prayers were unanswered. Uh -uh. None were unanswered. Is that not Andrew Murray? None were unanswered. Every prayer he prayed, the man that had an orphanage for boys, is that not Andrew Murray? George Muller. None, none. All his prayers. What kind of man was that? That's a man who lives in absolute trust to God. Those are the things I used to motivate myself. If you like, have all the money in the world. Just let me, let my prayer altar be working. Let me know how to connect with God. You will find out that birds will be coming from the east. Men who execute his counsel will be coming from far countries. I will just be laboring my labor there. Laboring there. Then somebody will see the dress that you sold for one, 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 one person on the road. Say, who sold this? You say, ah, it's one girl on one corner. She doesn't even have a shop. Then the person comes to meet you and says, you, my, my, you, you are my tailor for, for life. And the thing you sold, there was nothing fantastic about it. But because mammon does not have a throne in your heart, God has decided to put your, your name in somebody else's heart. That's how it works. Number two, you don't chase money to make money. If you want to make money, you chase value. There must be something that you have you are, you are put your hand to that allows you a channel that God can use to bless you. That's what the Bible says. That there is much food in the tillage of the poor. Do your job faithfully. If you are a teacher, teach with honor. Be content with what God has blessed you with. Be content. Be content. The problem is we are putting ourselves under unnecessary pressure to try to prove a point. Number three. Number three. Wealth is fleeting and unreliable. First Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10. Oh, let's begin at verse. Let's begin at verse 1. Wealth is fleeting and unreliable. Okay, go to verse 10. Go to verse 10. Verse 10, verse 10, verse 10, verse 10. 6. First Timothy chapter 6. He says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. For which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with what? Many souls. So the love of money. That means money in itself is not evil. Are you with me? What did I say? It's not evil. You need money to buy. And that's what makes money very powerful. Anything that is for sale can be bought with money. Did you hear what I said? Anything that is for sale can be bought with money. There are even people that are for sale. And it's not today they started selling themselves. In the book of Matthew, the Bible tells us that they were security guards whom the high priests and all these people called and they gave them a narrative, a lie to tell regarding the resurrection of Jesus. And after they told them that lie, they gave them money. They had a price. 
So there are even human beings that have a price tag. Some young girls, their price tag is a Samsung Ultra 23. For some, it's an iPhone. For the ones that have not seen anything, it's AJ Bread. <laughs> they have a price tag. So even human beings can be bought. That's what makes money very powerful. Anything that is for sale can be bought with money. And this is why most people are willing to do anything to have money. Because money gives you some kind of power. And this is why in society today, men are not measured by character anymore. Men are not measured by the, 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 the content of their person, their integrity. Just let a man have money. Even the church of present day will celebrate him. You know parents tell their, their daughters, um, don't marry a man that does not have money. Oh. Marry a man that has money. Even in church today, we are, we, are, we, are, we are committing all kinds of immorality with men that have money. So somebody that we know is a thief, but because he has money, we give him a front seat in church. In fact, in some places, if you have enough money, money is equal to the anointing. So if you have enough money, they give you a church to pastor. Now, if you have enough money, you can look like a successful preacher. Because what my generation likes now is just to put programs together, just have money and do programs, do programs, do programs, do programs, and then add bread and tea, add rice, share food, give people things. Then ministry has started. So now, if you have money, you can marry the best of preachers in our, in our, in our, in our day. You can be recognized. As somebody of value, even if we, do, we cannot even point to say this is where your money came from. Greed and covetousness has taken over. But the Bible says that the love of money, money in itself is not bad, but the love of it is the root of all evil. Because you cannot love God and love mammon. Once money takes over a man's heart, he says, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greed and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I want to build from here next week. I need to ask somebody a question. Have you wondered why these days you have lost your joy? Have you wondered why these days your spiritual life is no longer as attractive as it used to be? Is it not because you have pierced yourself with many sorrows? Because of a craving for money that is driven by greed. Many have strayed from the faith. <laughs> you know, I studied church history a little and I found out that the days of the church, my brother, when they manifested such great power it was the days of their greatest want and lack. You don't need to believe me. I tell you every time. If you go and research what I'm saying and you find that I'm lying, come and raise your hand. We will give you mic. Prosperity did more harm to the church than poverty. In the days of their lack, they burned with beautiful fire. Go and read. Strange miracles were wrought that mortals could not, could not understand what manner of men they were. There is something the love of money does to the body and I am afraid our generation is already being plagued by that disease. This is why we must come back and sit down and ask ourselves, what did Jesus really teach? What did he say? That's why God is blessing some of you. You are waiting till you are making one million in a month. You don't know that this is the time you have to begin to ensure that money is not a God in your heart. 
when are you going to start giving? Do you know that a preacher does not need to call you to a meeting? If you come to church and you see a brother whose shirt is not nice, God is supposed to be able to put his finger in your heart and say, praise. Go and bring that blouse you have not worn in that your wardrobe and package it and give it to that sister next week. But we don't hear those kind of instructions anymore because greed has finished us. Greed has plagued us. Somebody will have more than enough. He never thinks of the next person. So our car parks are filled with cars and some are dying. That's not the model of the early church. It's not the model. Am I now saying that people should just come to church and be loafing around and just be saying, huh, my money day your hand. That's not what I'm saying. That's foolishness. And that is why some of you, you are struggling and you are going through tough time and God is not causing anybody to remember you. Because you are breaking a major principle. Salvation of the poor man is what? Hard work. That's why it looks as if nobody is just think of me. Oh God. Oh God. Nobody. God will not put your thoughts in anybody's heart because he knows that you are a drain. A drain. God does not, does not encourage mental slot. He does not encourage laziness. But what he does is that he creates a bridge. He sees that you are doing the best that you can. Then there will be somebody who will call his, one of his sons from the east. And that one will come and be a, a bridge for you to the next level. That's how it works. That's how it works. Tonight, the only prayer I came with is that we will beg God, remove greed from my heart. Save me from the lust that Mammon is selling. Mammon is selling lust now. Now, some of you can't see anything good about yourself because you don't have money. The only way you think that your life will ever make sense is out of plenty of money. And that's why I've never seen anybody who has made it their life's assignment to pursue money that ever got it. Especially if you are a Christian. God will keep making sure that when he looks as if you want to enter the breakthrough, he will shift it. He will shift it. But tonight he wants to cure you of greed. The Lord told me to pray for gamblers tonight. If you are serious... You can walk to the altar tonight. You want to break that addiction of gambling on your life. Uh, you will find out that that appetite will leave you tonight. And God will begin to open you up to deeper expressions. God can meet your needs. I tell you the truth. He can meet your needs. I am proof. That if God takes you as a project, men will stand in awe. Men will be amazed at what God can do with a life that is surrendered to Him. I tell you the truth. They mocked and said, Nothing good will come out of that life. But they did not know that God had not spoken His last word yet. He was still walking a great walk. And as I'm standing here, he's not yet finished. I wonder what it will look like when he's finished. I wonder what it will look like. Rise on your feet tonight and you are praying one prayer. Lord, wherever there is greed, wherever mammon has placed a hold on my soul, deliver me tonight. As you show me principles, as you teach me mysteries in this series, deliver me tonight. If I were you, I would pray. And you that has been struggling with the addiction of gambling, you can come forward now. We've run out of time. We still have a baby to dedicate quickly. If you know you want to break the hold of that addiction on your life, 
on site or online you can raise your hands and walk out here and say I, I, I'm walking away from this stuff I'm walking away from this stuff I'm making an open show an open confession tonight and I'm delivering myself wherever you are pray the Lord has assured me that in this house in ancient worry there's going to be an overflow of prosperity the works of our hands are going to be mightily blessed those of us that have committed to hard work the Lord the Lord the Lord the Lord the Lord the Lord he will bless the work of your hands greed must die a natural death greed must lose his hold over you God bless you sir La bota bate kabilas ida borakabole badi adoba endi la brosa parios. As you come out, tell the Lord this hold must of gambling must leave my heart. Just begin to talk to Him, talk to Him, talk to Him. Your son, pray for him now. Pray for him. I am an amane kenyona. Can you pray? Can you pray? Only man am I Lord, uproot it from my heart. For someone, call the person's name. Call the person's name. That Lord, this demon of greed and lust, let it live this boy's life, this girl's life. Call the person's name. If you're online, the same power we feel in this house is reaching you where you are. That demon of greed that is giving mammon access to crippled destinies we bind that foul spirit tonight you will think I'm just talking right now some of you will come back with a testimony even before the end of this week your, your sibling your, your, your family member that was under that influence you will see a radical transformation because I see that appetite dying. I see it dying. Ooh. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Oh, 
we've run out of time. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Lord, everyone here standing for themselves or standing for someone else, Lord, we arrest that foul spirit. And we decree from tonight that demon of greed driving the, the, the ones that they stand for, the ones that stand for themselves, driving them under the control of mammon. That demon is bound tonight. That strange appetite is arrested tonight. We release them, oh God, into a new experience with you. But adventure, the ones they are standing for, they are standing for themselves, is not born again. Lord, by reason of this contact, you will bring those ones into your kingdom. Thank you for these testimonies on site and online. Thank you for the great things that you've done. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Go back to your seat quickly before we move into the dedication now. Now, listen. God is speaking to me about some people who are like Judas. Who are like Judas. Hmm. You touched money that belongs to God. You touched money that belongs to God. And that thing has become a legal tender in the spirit. It is an accusation from Satan against you. And that is why your finances have continued to suffer. What I'm saying literally is that you stole from God. Either in church or money that church gave you to hold, you stole it. There's a plague on your finances. But as I was praying for these people, I saw that the mercy of God was coming upon that individual. Whether you are here or you are online, I know it like I know my name. God spoke to me. I'm not going to tell you to come out. Those are sensitive issues. But as far as you are under the sound of my voice, that bill of accusation that Satan had against you has been nailed to the cross. The Lord has just ushered you into a new season. A new beginning. Those of you that greed has been working upon your soul. You know what I'm saying. God has been working on you trying to get you to do the right thing with your finances. But greed has been like an armed man. Great deliverance has happened tonight. Great deliverance. I see people like walking out of cages. Walking out of cages. A great deliverance has happened tonight. And so you will know I didn't lie. You will begin to see the, and hear the testimonies of how God has begun to cause men to prosper. Amen. You will see. You will see. You will see. Because now, there are some of you here, your rank just increased in the spirit. Amen. The Lord is now going to entrust you with the kind of kingdom wealth that you never knew. Amen. Because you, are now, you have now become a channel. Amen. You've signed a covenant to become a channel. The Lord is now going to move resources in your direction. Amen. Because he knows that if he gets to you, it will get to your brother. Amen. If he gets to you, it will get to his kingdom work. Amen. So he's moving it now. I'm seeing it moving in the spirit. You, you may not believe it, but I'm seeing it moving now, 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 now. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. Lift your hands and just say, Lord, bless the work of my hands. Pray it in one minute. Raise your hand and say, Lord, bless the work of my hands. It doesn't matter whether you are a mechanic, you are, you, are, you are a fashion designer, furniture maker, a teacher, policeman in the military. Just say, bless the work of my hands. Oh my God. <laughs> bless the work of my hands. Bless the work of my hands. Be deliberate about it. You will see that these prayers, we did not pray them in vain. Graphics designer, photographer. You are in oil and gas. Wherever you are, God has blessed you. You are in construction. Bless the work of my hands. You own your own business or you work for somebody. The prayer is simple. Bless the work of my hands.
Barakaya. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There's such rich presence.